be present via teleconferencing. I know Philip's in the building, so I think he'll be here fairly shortly. And uh, I think, Jim, you're holding the proxy for Jim Allister, who's going to be late because he's at the uh, Public Accounts Committee. OK. Not the Public Accounts Committee. Um, the audit, committee. Audit, audit Committee. Sorry, my normal service of exactitude is probably not quite its usual self today, but it shall restore itself after I've had three more gulps of coffee as we move through. Uh, moving on, next one to the Declaration of Interest. I have a declaration of interest to uh, raise on the correspondence we will see. There is a letter from one of my constituents to the committee, reference complaints he has about the Northern Ireland Civil Service and the HR function that has been uh, conducted by the Department of Finance. It wouldn't be appropriate if I was involved in the discussions when that uh, level of correspondence comes up, but I uh, just wanted to make you aware that that was, that was, that was, the, that was the situation on the occasion. Any others? Yeah. Uh, draft minutes of proceedings, the 18th of November. The draft minutes uh, are at page six. Members, are we content with the draft minutes? Agreed. Happy to be published on the website? Agreed. Mm -hmm. uh, matters arising, functioning of government miscellaneous bill, uh, a notice of withdrawal of amendments tabled at, uh, on the 17th of November for consideration stages. It's page 13. A notice of amendments tabled on the 17th of November for consideration stage is at page 14. Members, are we content to note? So noted. If we can move on now to the oral evidence. This is the oral evidence from the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service with reference to the amendments to the building regulations Northern Ireland 2012. The session is being recorded by Hansard. Uh, we are welcoming Michael Graham, Paddy Gallagher and Jeff Somerville. Is there anybody out there in the ether can hear us? Yes, Michael, uh, Paddy. I am the Chief Fire and Rescue Officer here. Um, are you happy that I give you our uh, verbal submission as a starting point to inform the members? Uh, yes, please. Just before that, I, just, I need to just sort of brief the team first. Uh, we have a clerk's brief at page 17. Uh, the response from the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Consultation, uh, the Fire and Rescue to the consultation is at page 20. And the extract from the Department of Finance, the committee regarding proposed cons consultation is at page 47. Michael, would you be happy to make an opening statement? Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invite to come and talk to the committee today uh, on the consultation return of the proposed amendments to the Northern Ireland Building Regulations. And apologies for not being with you in person. Uh, probably useful if I first introduce myself. Uh, I'm Michael Graham, the current Chief Fire and Rescue Officer for the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, I've been the post for around 18 months now. I'm joined, as you say, by Assistant Chief Fire and Rescue Officer Paddy Gallagher, who's responsible for our Service Delivery Directorate, and uh, Group Commander Jeff Somerville, who is the lead officer uh, for the area of work we're discussing today and who actually made the return on our behalf. Uh, I thought it might be useful, Chair, uh, to give you a, a bit of an overview of where this work fits in uh, to our overall purpose of helping to make Northern Ireland a safer place, if that would be helpful. Uh, so if I take you through what our service delivery um, actually looks like, there are four key areas. Uh, the first one is response, which is the one people will be most familiar with, which is where our firefighters turn out in fire plants and deal with fires and other incidents. Our resilience department, which works with other agencies around emergency planning and specialist response to events such as flooding and, and wildfires. Our prevention work, which is where we engage with members of the public to uh, reduce the risk of fire occurring mostly in people's homes uh, through activities such as home fire safety checks. And probably the final part of the, the four-piece jigsaw is the one we're discussing and, and focusing on today, which is our protection work. And this focuses on fire safety within the build environment. Uh, it'd be important for me to say that, that they are all uh, equally important uh, when it comes to keeping people safe. And it is ACFRO Gallagher's responsibility to move these pieces to ensure uh, the safety of our community and our firefighters. Uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, once a building is completed and defined as a relevant premises, uh, we become the enforcing authority for fire safety measures required 
by the Fire Safety uh, and Rescue Services Northern Ireland Order 2006 and the Fire Safety Regulations Northern Ireland 2010. Um, it, look, it might be obvious to, her to say, but, but our firefighters and, and officers rely on a robust building regulations to ensure that buildings are designed and built to be safe in the event of a fire. Um, this not only protects the users of the building, but look, it protects our people when they are required to enter buildings, to fight fires and carry out rescues. As you'd imagine, it, it's really difficult for officers at the scene of a fire to develop and implement uh, an effective operational plan and ultimately save people's lives if we cannot reasonably predict the behaviour of that fire within the built environment. Um, as an experienced fire officer, I watched, uh, as many did, the, the events of uh, Grenfell Tower on the 14th of June 2017 unfold. And the resultant tragic deaths of, of 72 people uh, will forever uh, be a reminder, hopefully to us all, that the outcome can be when fire safety is not regulated and applied in an effective way. Uh, we as a service welcome the recommendations uh, made by uh, Dame Judith Hackett uh, following uh, the Grenfell Inquiry and the Building a Safer Future report and any future recommendations that may follow through subsequent phases of the Grenfell Tower Inquiry. Uh, we believe the recommendations will assist us uh, to improve our service to the public and <coughs> hopefully going forward improve building safety. Uh, just to let you know, two of our protection officers, one of which is GC Somerville, uh, sit as members of the Fire Safety Subcommittee of the Northern Ireland Building Regulations Committee and uh, they have considering and provided input through the chair of that committee on proposed building regulation amendments in advance of the public consultation. Um, our consultation return is based, you know, quite unashamedly on our desire to enhance public and firefighter safety, uh, and uh, we've not commented on the wider considerations such as cost of additional measures or the capability of industry to be able to deliver any of the enhancements uh, we have suggested or, or have been suggested. Uh, we, we do recognise our views may not all be adopted uh, in, uh, when other areas are considered through the appropriate impact assessments, but as you would expect, we have focused on achieving a high level of safety in buildings being built in the future across Northern Ireland. J.C. Uh, uh, Somerville is sitting with me here. If it is helpful, Chair, he can take you through our primary and focused response uh, to the consultation. Um, if that would be helpful prior to inviting questions. Uh, yes, please. Okay, I'll hand over to Jeff. Okay, Chair, many thanks. Uh, I will go through these in, in the order that the questions were presented in the consultation return, and I'm just providing a very short summary uh, of the key elements of that return. Uh, in relation to Part A of the Building Regulations Interpretation and General, NFRS support the proposal to require a building which becomes a relevant building due to material change of use to be subject to the requirements of the new regulation 23.2. Of course, you know that that regulation will uh, require a classification of uh, a non-combustible or limited combustibility for the external cladding of a building, uh, and we would support that. Uh, in relation to Part B, materials and workmanship, NFRS welcomes the proposal to enhance public safety in relevant buildings by specifying which materials used in the construction of an external wall should be non-combustible. Question B2, the proposed definition for relevant buildings includes dwellings, flats, hospitals, old people's homes, residential care premises for children or the elderly, boarding schools and student accommodation. However, NFRS would wish to see the proposed definition of relevant buildings be extended to also include hotels, hostels and boarding houses because people are at, greatest, at the greatest risk from fire when they are asleep. In addition, question B3, NFRS would support a lower height threshold for the ban in a relevant building to be at a lower height of 11 metres rather than the 18 metres proposed, because in NFRS opinion, 11 metres is the upper limit of traditional external firefighting techniques. Over this height, a sorry, high just, reach of sorry, uh, Jeff, does that mean that's the height of the ladder, or is that the height of the, the hose extension, or what does that mean specifically? Uh, the 11 metres height is the uh, 
effective height that we can operate a firefighting jet to. In addition, uh, we carry portable ladders on our appliances that will allow us to work from the head of a ladder to be able to extinguish a fire, and that is effective up to about 11 metres. Right. Over that height, and between 11 metres and 18 metres, we rely on a high-reach appliance uh, to be able to extinguish the fire on the outside of a building over that height. Uh, but that depends very much on access, which uh, you'll know is very limited in most buildings. And building regulations only require uh, a small percentage of the external part of a building uh, to permit high-reach appliance access. Okay. And just, um, just to go back, uh, just wait. When we're talking about uh, a, I think it's a relevant re relevant building you're talking about in residential buildings. Why are hotels, uh, just for my education, why are hotels not part of that uh, definition already? Uh, the, the, the definition that Northern Ireland is proposing mirrors that as to what has been adopted by the Grenfell Inquiry and is uh, mirroring what's happened in England. Uh, the reason for why hotels, hostels and boarding houses are currently excluded is because there is a higher level of fire safety management in those premises All right. uh, because they would be covered, they would be considered as relevant premises and therefore would have fire alarm systems and also managers on the premises to tell people what to do in the event of fire. And that would be the reason why that has been excluded in England and also uh, proposed for Northern Ireland, I believe. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, moving on then, NFRS would support that the ban on combustible materials will extend to specified attachments. NFRS supports that an exemption list is provided for some components of the external wall system and has provided comments on the items listed. NFRS agrees that metal composite panel with a polyethylene core of 30% or more should be banned from being used in external wall construction of any building, regardless of height or purpose. In relation to Part C, site preparation and resistance to contaminants and moisture, NFRS has no views on these matters because they are outside the remit of Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service. In relation to Part E, Technical Booklet E, Fire Safety, NFRS agrees with the proposal in Section 5 of the consultation version for relevant buildings. NFRS agrees with the use of only European classifications, which will make Technical Book of E easier to understand. NFRS agrees with the new text proposed for Paragraph 5.4, which states that cladding and specified materials in all buildings over 18 metres must be of limited combustibility. The clarity provided by this new text is exactly what designers and regulators require when considering proposals for new buildings. NFRS would question the content of the proposed paragraph 5.4a, which states that consideration should be given to the prevention of external fire spread. However, Table 5.1a, the new table, states that no provisions or no minimum performance are specified for certain types of building. Therefore, NFRS or any other regulator will not be able to assess if paragraph 5.4a has been met in those buildings, which there are no provisions or no minimum performance criteria. It would be helpful to remove any ambiguity so that a designer or a regulator is able to determine if paragraph 5.4a has been met by comparing proposals against specific criteria. Without specific criteria, it would not be possible for a designer or a regulator to determine if the design proposal is or is not acceptable. Therefore, NFRS would suggest that further consideration be given to this matter. Chair, that concludes uh, a summary of the technical aspects of our consultation return, uh, and I can hand back over to our Chief Fire Officer. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, there's just a few before I open up to the rest of the committee to ask a couple of questions. Um, one of the first questions is obviously this issue about buildings that are over the height of uh, 18 metres, uh, which come within the classification. Have we got a rough idea of how many buildings we're talking about in Northern Ireland? Uh, yes, 
Chair, uh, we estimate that there's 147 buildings that would fall into that classification. Uh, so it's a relative small number of buildings, and the impact assessment done by the Department of Finance estimates that there would be an additional three buildings per year that would fall into that classification. Okay. Um, I know it's probably a slightly technical question, but when you talk about limited uh, combustibility, does that mean that the materials to do that need to be able to be fire resistant for a particular period of time? Or is that actually based on the sort of the materials that the, the, the materials that the uh, cladding is actually manufactured from? Uh, yes, they, each one of these materials must now be uh, classified, subject to this going ahead to European classification A two S one D naught or class A one. Now, those are technical tests carried out under British or and European standard. And effectively, what that means is an A2S1 D0 or A2 will not significantly contribute to the fire load. So it could be described as limited combustibility. Uh, and so they'll not compute, contribute to a fire. They will produce weak or no smoke at all and no flaming droplets or particles. So it's a very, very safe product when used on the outside of a building. In addition to that, then the A1 classification will not contribute at any stage to any stage of the fire, uh, including a fully developed fire or present a smoke hazard. So they're two of the uh, highest standards for building safety. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Uh, I'm just going to introduce now Jim Wells has got a couple of questions to ask. Uh, thank you for a very clear uh, explanation, both written and oral. Much appreciated. And jargon-free as well, which is great to see. Um, just a couple of questions. First of all, would it be normal for Northern Ireland to step out of line with regulations which are pertain to the rest of the United Kingdom? In other words, do we have the power to go a bit further and make our legislation even tighter on this, uh, these products? I think that question, uh, Chair, really is a matter for the Department of Finance. Northern Ireland, of course, can step outside and decide what building regulations they wish to introduce themselves. And there's no requirement to uh, blindly follow what has happened in the other jurisdictions. So that is certainly within the gambit of Northern Ireland to do uh, what they think is right for the safety of the public. Thank you. And also leading on from what the Chair has just said, I think we were all quite surprised when you said that hotels and hostels weren't included within the ambit. Now, that's, you explained that by saying that the internal arrangements for fire protection prevention in those are already of a higher standard but that's the internal layout of the building that doesn't mean that the actual fabric of the building <coughs> is any less or more likely to uh, uh, become a fire hazard um, is that not a very obvious omission in the regulations which draws into question um, the efficacy of, of those who, who drew, them up, drew them up uh, no, I think, I think it, it's quite important like, that NFRS's opinion would be that those buildings should be included as well. And I know that in England they have went to a further consultation to also consider including those buildings. Uh, so it, it is a topic that's uh, under further scrutiny, both in England and Wales, uh, and has been, is being consideration, considered, of course, in this consultation proposal for Northern Ireland. This is maybe, I mean, obviously, we're all absolutely horrified by what we saw at Grenfell Tower, absolutely dreadful scenes. I presume Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue has a fair idea of any buildings in the province where this might yeah. be an issue. Uh, we certainly do. We have engaged with the owners of all buildings uh, uh, across Northern Ireland. We do that on a regular basis. Uh, and we have not identified that there is any residential buildings in Northern Ireland of the type. Uh, compared to Grenfell. Uh, any buildings that we uh, do visit, we provide a detailed range of advice where we can under our legislative remit, uh, and we work with the manager of buildings to make those as safe as possible. So thankfully, the risk profile in Northern Ireland is significantly different to what uh, has appeared in England uh, and Wales. Well, that's, that's obviously very good news, but I think one of the points that came out of the Grenfell Tower inquiry was that there were materials which had been identified by the manufacturers as being a risk uh, to, to, to human health and, and safety, and that had been ignored. 
It could be that there are materials in Northern Ireland where a similar process has been undertaken. How confident can we be of the tests that have been carried out on materials used in Northern Ireland? I think it's really important that the, the future proposals in Northern Ireland is that a building safety programme group uh, is, has been set up uh, that will sit independently to look at building safety and building risk in Northern Ireland. And it would be a key uh, recommendation of NFRS that that group should consider that risk profile in Northern Ireland, look for other buildings and where buildings may need uh, or, or to identify what that risk is so that the owners of those buildings can be advised accordingly. Uh, and I think that definitely is a proposal for Northern Ireland and NFRS would very much support that. The reason I asked that question, in Dundrum, in my own constituency, we had far, a fire um, uh, uh, on a cladding, of ha uh, which were former housing executive houses. And whilst, thankfully, there were no fatalities or injuries, the fire did spread very quickly, being house to house, along the cladding. Now, they're only two storey. And that did raise the question as to whether there were products in the province which, which but it's not the same as used in Grenfell Tower, where, in fact, could be dangerous. And I remember writing to Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue and the Health and Safety Executive at the time, saying, are you absolutely certain that everything is safe? Now, the view, the view was, in fact, that, yeah, it's OK. It's, a, it's the Church, Church Grove, Church Square development in Dundrum. And it was quite obvious to me that the fire spread along the first story on the outside cladding. Um, therefore, I'm slightly worried that you're saying that you're convinced there's nothing of a similar danger here. Are you saying there's nothing here to worry about at only in high-rise buildings rather than ordinary housing? Yeah, I think it's got to be very clear that the buildings that I'm talking about are buildings that are proposed under this new definition of relevant building, which is a building over 18 metres heights, 18 metres high. In buildings under 18 metres high, the owner of those buildings should consider, uh, through building regs, that they're required to, to consider external fire spread. However, uh, as I mentioned in my previous technical return, there are no provisions in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the requirements for combustibility on, on buildings such as the one you've described for buildings under 18 metres. So, uh, so, in other words, you're saying that you're safe if you're over 18 metres, but be very worried if you're under. Surely this should apply to all buildings, no matter what height they are. This fire occurred at night. The only thing that saved the situation is that one of the residents happened to be up at 2 and 3 in the morning and spotted the fire and was able to alert his neighbours. But, but surely the same principle should apply to any building, regardless of its height. I think the very important thing to uh, take in mind is the reason why buildings are built in the certain way that they are. And it's all about means of escape and getting people out in the event of fire is what's most important. And that's why there's these key thresholds in building regulations at 11 metres and 18 metres, because below that height, it is about getting people out and making sure that they're safe. So as occurred in that iron and drum, all people safely did get out of the building because the building is a low-rise building and therefore uh, there, there's a much higher degree of safety when you're close to the ground and are able to evacuate easy. So that's really just one of those facts that, that that's how building regulations are written uh, and that's what building regulations aim to achieve. But they only got out of the building because the gentleman got up and went and banged the doors of five other properties and got the people out. They were asleep at the time. And the fire spread very rapidly and the cladding on the first floor. And would it, be, would it be problematic to make the same rules applicable to domestic dwellings as high-rise flats, hostels, etc., and hotels? I think Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service would love to see all buildings be made completely non-combustible. But in the practical side of things, it's simply not possible. Uh, and really, that's a matter for uh, a cost versus benefit analysis in terms of the building industry compared to what those proposals would require. So uh, I think when that impact assessment would be done, the cost could be prohibitively expensive to do it. Of course, Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service key focus would be on providing effective prevention advice. And that's one of our key work streams for all of those buildings that fall below 18 metres. 
uh, our firefighters tirelessly uh, carry out home fire safety checks and we visit premises right across Northern Ireland to provide prevention advice. Uh, and really, it's uh, a lot of fire safety is about what people do in the event of fire and knowing what they need to do when a fire happens and taking the right action. So we, we very much rely on prevention to look at those other buildings that aren't, aren't uh, uh, or sorry, that are below the 18 metres height, for example. Okay, thank you. Yep, thanks. And, and just before I bring in the next person as well, I, I sort of raises an interesting question. Because obviously one of the things, and you'll be well aware of what's happening in Grenfell at the moment, is um, there was two companies that have been particularly singled out. I think it's Arconix and Celotex that have been uh, I said that they were providing substandard materials and knew that they were providing substandard materials. So the first question I really have is, do we know if Arconix or Celotex, and I know they're major suppliers for the building industry, has a lot of their material been used here in Northern Ireland and have we had the chance to test it? And are you feeling within the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service that there is a pushback from uh, uh, industry uh, banning the use of sort of anything that's got a, a polyurethane core of uh, sort of greater than 30%? Because I think that's the critical factor area. Uh, if you could just answer those before we move on to the next one. Yeah, I think, I think the key aspect to look at there is that the proposed amendment to building regulations is actually not going to permit those types of products to ever happen on buildings again. Uh, and that's what's key important going forward. Uh, it's difficult that building regulations can't go back and look at buildings that may have already have that cladding fitted. Uh, but out of the 147 buildings in Northern Ireland that have got cladding on them, we have visited uh, the great majority of those premises to confirm that the measures that they have in place are appropriate. And bear in mind that the responsibility for fire safety in those buildings does sit with the owner of the building, who must ensure under the legislative requirements that their building is safe for people's use. So there has been such extensive documentation produced following Grenfell about how to assess a building's safety in relation to ACM cladding and the types of cladding that have been found uh, wanting as a result of Grenfell, uh, that uh, that work is a very, very key thing that needs to continue as we go forward. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, it's just we has found you the ratchet. Thank you for your statement. Uh, can I say too that in, uh, the the consultation itself and your answers to it, and that was very, very informative. Uh, made me very aware just of some of the issues, not that. that uh, firefighters that are confronted with on a daily basis, I'm sure, in many respects as well, too. Uh, and again, too, I was intrigued by uh, this uh, differentia uh, differential between uh, relevant buildings and uh, relevant premises. And, and, and I just wonder, uh, have you any statistics um, that would compare, say, the likelihood of fire in the first instance uh, in relation to relevant premises and relevant buildings, and I know that it is your sort of uh, objective to see them all classified more or less uh, on a similar basis. Uh, yeah, look, you, you're asking there, do we have statistics comparing relevant premises to uh, relevant buildings? And the answer is we wouldn't have statistics because buildings are not categorised uh, as either a relevant building or a relevant premises. Uh, it, it, it's quite complicated uh, when it comes to actually drawing up statistics as to the number of fires and the danger and risk uh, exposed by fire. The key aspect for the Fire and Rescue Service and what these building regulations are attempting to achieve is that a fire will not spread beyond the compartment of origin. And uh, if we all think back, we got considerable uh, footage in the media at the Coolmoyne house fire back uh, that happened only six months after the Grenfell disaster. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that fire, the fire was confined to the room of origin uh, on the ninth floor of a high rise uh, block. And that is exactly how we expect fire to, behavior, to behave, uh, which allows us to provide a very effective response to extinguish a fire. So that's what should happen in the event of a fire, and they, really that's what building regulations and this proposed amendment is all designing to achieve. Uh, thank you. And just in addition, then, uh, is there an application as well to have a limitation 
in respect of the resources that you have at your disposal uh, when attacking, let's say, a fire that is uh, in a building of that bitter height? Um, sorry, I have to do, sorry, I didn't quite pick up the question. I picked that one up. Um, so, uh, in terms of the resources that you have at your disposal, uh, is there a limitation there that whenever you talk about, uh, let's we'll say, um, buildings at a lower height, 11 metres, I think it was, that you said that where you can access the outside cladding yeah. and so on and safely remove it in the event of it going on fire, um, uh, is that as a result of, uh, we'll say, the limitations uh, in terms of your uh, equipment and the likes of it? Um, or yeah, well, they do. Yeah, so yeah. Look, just around, um, obviously we have a set, what we would call a predetermined attendance, uh, depending on the, the type of the premises that are actually in fire. So for you know a, a normal property fire, it would be uh, two pumps and above, and it would change depending on the type of fire going forward. Uh, we obviously have, uh, we've very recently purchased uh, new high reach appliances, which reach up to uh, 42 metres. Uh, um, as Jeff has already said, we carry portable ladders uh, within each of the appliances. So we will always um, mobilise the appropriate weight of response uh, depending on the premises that are actually in fire. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mr. Pat? Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, thanks for your oral evidence um, the, from the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service. Um, I have just two. Quick questions. One is, what do you yourself, what does the fire service think the impact of the proposed changes will be? And in your view, is the current building regulations, do they require any further strengthening? Uh, I think the, the impact of the proposed changes uh, are covered in detail by the, in the impact assessment done by the Department of Finance. The impact is relatively small in Northern Ireland in that we do not have a large number of high-rise premises, uh, with only 147 that we estimate, and an estimated three new premises per year. This will have a very, very low impact in terms of uh, the built environment in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, can you just uh, reconfirm the second part of your question? And the second, well, thanks first of all for that. And the second part is, in your opinion, the current building regulations do they require any further strengthening and other aspects from a fire safety perspective? Uh, yes, we would support uh, a lot of other changes to the building regulations, uh, and those are actually proposed. Uh, and uh, we will work with the Northern Ireland Building Regulations Advisory Council to bring those through, through in, in due course. So there are a series of other amendments proposed, uh, and NFRS uh, certainly would wish to see more amendments being made to make fire safety in buildings even safer in Northern Ireland. But thankfully, you'll be glad to hear that programme of work uh, is ongoing and uh, we're fully engaged uh, in assisting with that. Thank you. OK, cheers. Paul? Yes, just on that question, thank you very much, Paul Frew, uh, Deputy Chair of the Committee here. Uh, can I ask just, can you outline in, in a brief terms what those other proposals would be that you're trying to work in? Uh, I, I simply could not do that because there's quite a, a, a large number of them. Uh, uh, it, it, it's all from uh, simple things to do with smoke alarms and domestic premises right through to uh, other types of changes that are proposed. Uh, so it, it would be impossible to cover those. I think there's, uh, there, there's many hundreds of amendments being proposed to uh, technical booklet E. Uh, and to cover them, uh, it would take yes. a very long time. No, I, I it, understand that, and we're all... I don't all, have the information to hand at present. Yeah, we're all, we're all quite busy, but could you even provide the, the committee uh, with a written paper on that? Yeah. Sure. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, sorry, the question was, would it be possible to give us a written paper to the committee? Because uh, even though we are the um, Committee for Finance, uh, building regulations come under our remit, and I think we would quite like to see the proposals you would like to put in. Because, uh, again, one of the things that we as executive want to see is we want to see a substantial increase in the house building programme, particularly in social, social housing. And what we would like to see, of course, is this social housing that's being built to the highest 
possible standards for both the people who will be using for it and, more importantly, in some respects, to make sure the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service are not unduly burdened. And if we could have that, that would be quite, uh, that would be quite useful. Uh, Chair, I, I really would like to encourage us taking any proposals through the NIBRAC subcommittee for fire safety, because that's where we do our programme of work and we discuss those with the other agencies who also bring forward those changes, such as uh, local council building control, for example. So that programme of work is ongoing. Uh, this is the first element of that process, uh, bringing through these consultation changes in relation to relevant buildings and, and following Grenfell. Uh, but that further program of work is going to continue for quite some time. So I really would try and encourage that uh, we allow that to work through and bring our proposals through that group uh, as, as the best forum for doing that. Chair, would it, would it be helpful if uh, our membership within that subcommittee um, had that conversation with the committee and asked that those proposals are yeah. forwarded to yourselves where appropriate? Yeah, yeah, that would, that, sorry, go ahead, yeah that, that would be great, and thank you. Uh, can I ask then, whilst we have this stipulation of 18 metres, and I understand completely why that would be, and I know I understand completely why you'd want to reduce that to 11. Uh, but, and again, it's not it's not necessarily a question for you with regards to the impact assessment, but surely that will have a, an effect on the product. So why why would anybody want to use a product? that was deemed not safe for 18 metres. Why would anyone want to put that in a, in a building that was uh, six metres or seven metres? I think that this is all about market response and, and, and by specifying in law and technical booklet what products are permissible keeps that very, very much restricted. Uh, we did see and we have seen the reports in only the last fortnight of the phase two Grenfell inquiry reporting that uh, certain manufacturers falsified literature uh, or allegedly a falsified literature uh, indicating that their products were safer than they were and, and that's really what this is uh, and the outcome of the Grenfell inquiry is identifying that uh, all the processes in that regard are not as robust as what they need to be which is why of course these uh, amendments are being made to our own building regulations. Just on that because I do having read some of the articles uh it seems to be the case that there has been this flaw of non-compliance and then uh, things being products being advertised in error or, or by design. Uh, what's to prevent that happening in the future with regards to false documentation, false compliance and false testing? I think it's all about certification and the oversight of that. And of course, you know, the Grenfell Inquiry looked for much stricter regulatory control over uh, building control processes and the entire industry. Uh, the industry has been found uh, there's significant shortfalls and the knowledge of architects, for example, as well. So uh, all of the recommendations in terms of Grenfell will make this uh, hopefully not happen in the future. Uh, but of course, there's still a fair bit of programme of work to bring that all into effect. Okay, C can I ask then, do you have any input uh, as a fire authority and everything else that you do, the responsibility you guys have and the, the good work you do for the population around, do you guys have any input into the actual testing regime mm -hmm. and classifications? You quote A2, S1, DO or Class A1. Do you have any input into the, those tests regimes and are you sufficiently assured that those are rigorous enough to actually provide the outcomes that they're designed to do? Uh, I'm glad to say we have no input whatsoever into those testing routines. routines. Uh, they are all British standards, they're accepted uh, at tests, they're European standards uh, and we would fully support that those uh, tests are robust uh, and that they are extremely effective. Uh, so I, we, we would have full support for them, but no, as a fire and rescue service, we do not have input into how those are done. We don't need it, to be quite frank. Uh, they are extremely effective, and uh, it's, it's very much the scientists who carry out those tests. And of course, we do have our own testing facilities in Northern Ireland uh, that sit with the University, or alongside the University of Ulster, uh, that provides such testing. 
Uh, Although I have 20 years in the construction mm -hmm. industry, I'll not present the pretense that I know what I'm talking about here, but th there seems to be the case that there's a number of test regimes, one being where they ground the material into powder to burn, and in another one where there is a rig set up to present uh, an example of a, f of, a f of a wall, which is then burnt uh, or tested under conditions. Uh, I take it these regulations, which I've just quoted, A2, S1, D0, or D0, D0, or Class 1, is the grounding of the material into a powder to burn. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. And, and uh, really, that, that test is proving that this product is non-combustible. So the proposal being brought into effect in Northern Ireland is no longer to accept that large-scale test, which is known as a British Standard 8414 test, which is a large-scale cladding test, uh, and then that, uh, the results of that test are evaluated using Building Research 135 paper to confirm that that material passes or fails that test. So the key aspect to recognise here is that that large-scale test will no longer be acceptable, but it will be the uh, non-combustible test, the first one that you described, that will be the acceptable test for the product. Uh, and of course, that is a much safer and higher standard. So, so basically, instead of testing a scenario or a wall example, you're testing the product itself ground into a powder. Is there any way or flaws, chinks in the armour that you can see with that test that would allow producers to gain the results, for want of a better yeah, word? Yeah, there, there's no flaws with the test. Where the flaws potentially can arise is if the building substitutes different products when it's being constructed, or the level and the quality of the construction is poor. Uh, for example, on the outside of a cladded building, there needs to be uh, cavity barriers put into place to stop a fire spreading up the inside of the cavity. It, it is when the building is being constructed, making sure that all of the design uh, elements are properly installed and properly fitted is uh, where the risk lies in, in terms of building construction. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question there. It does. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Pat, small. That was just small. Thanks very much. Pat Chapley coming back in. I noticed the fire service highlights that I highlighted that I didn't agree with the new guidance in relation to the external fire spread consideration. Uh, I just want to outline my objection to the new guidelines in relation to the external fire spread. Uh, considerations and how it impacts on the regulations that we're here and that we're trying to consider. I just needed that. That was all. I'm oh, sorry, you're just making a That's just, just wanted to make that point. Okay. Mr. Chairman, there's a message just coming on Twitter that the Finance Committee of the Northern Assembly is much more interesting than the plenary sessions. <laughs> Somebody who's watching. <laughs> <laughs> that says a lot. Uh, um, is that Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Pat. Um, sort of Michael, Paddy and Jeff, uh, thank you very much indeed for your evidence you've given today. However, there is a few further comments I would like to make. Uh, the first one is on behalf of our Health Minister uh, and indeed for all MLAs, I would just like to record how much we appreciate the world role and work of the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service. Here, here. Yep. And and secondly, on behalf of my chief whip, Roddy Butler, I wouldn't be allowed out without <laughs> saying that either. And we just wanted to thank you very much indeed from us for giving your evidence today. And would, if possible, if we have any further questions, we'd probably like to get back in contact with you at some stage. But again, thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for giving your evidence. Thank you, Chair, and, uh, and thanks to the committee. And we really genuinely appreciate uh, engaging in these conversations because uh, hopefully it's clear it's really important to us as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, Tim. If we move on to the next item on the agenda, which is Statute Rule 2020, Number 262, Financial Assistance, Coronavirus, Number Two, Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. And um, before we consider this. Uh, you will have noted, and I think we have circulated, there was a uh, press uh, statement that came out today, referenced one of our favourite uh, radio shows this morning, and particularly to do about wind turbines. <clears throat> and there was an interesting comment that was made at the end of that, and allow me just to bring it up so I can read it out into the record. If 
I can get my Of course, the BBC have probably thwarted us by taking it. Oh, no, here it is, it isn't. And I think this is germane because of the conversation we're having today about the speed with which we've turned these regulations around on behalf of the department. It's an article by David Thompson, Coronavirus Economy Department Official Backs Wind Turbine Grants. Uh, you can all read what it says in the body of it, but I would like to just draw your attention to the last uh, subparagraph, where it says, the Department for Finance says the Small Business Rate Release Scheme for 2021 was approved without change by the Executive and the Finance Committee. And I think by reading the article, I think indeed there was a reference seemed to be there that in some ways that was implying that we hadn't necessarily done our job, bearing in mind the speed with which we were required to get these regulations out and the speed with which we were required to get this support out as well. So I just wanted, as chairman of the committee, just to say that I um, express my concern with that comment being made by the Department of Finance, bearing in mind the job that we as a committee have tried to do, not just for the Department of Finance, but equally for the people of Northern Ireland. So I'd just like to have that recorded and just for people to be aware of that before we move on to the substantive issue. Are we content? Yes, I'm content. Through the chair, just I'd uh, like to just had it's not the first time that that particular TV show or radio show, which might be your most popular show, but not everyone's, uh, has made sort of the No, I like, sort of for the records, I like Frank Mitchell, U105. Yeah, or, yeah. Or, <laughs> or their statements that were creates some completely the wrong impression of what is exactly the truth. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And so if we now move on to the Structured Regulation 2020-262, Clark's Brief is on page 51. The Financial Assistance Coronavirus No. 2 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 is at page 52. The letter from the Minister regarding the urgency of the statutory rule is at page 57, which we may like to reflect on. Remind members that the clerk wrote to members on the 19th of November to inform members that due to the urgency of the statutory rule, the Department had cons requested that the Committee consider the rule without having first considered the policy proposals at the SL1 stage. Members were asked to indicate if they were content with this approach, and a majority of members agreed. And the members who agreed to this were Pat, Paul, Jim, Jim, Gemma, and myself. Okay. Bearing in mind that, can I seek your formal agreement for the purpose of a recording in the minutes for the committee to consider Statute Rule 2020, number 262, the Financial Assistance Coronavirus Number Two Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, without having first considered the SL1? I would like to inform the members that the purpose of the propose, proposed this urgent rule is made in order to ensure continuity of fiscal financial assistance to certain businesses affected by public health restrictions in the light of the health protection regulations led in the Assembly on 16 November 2020. The regulations are subject to the negative resolution procedure. I would like to draw members' attention that the examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported on statutory rule 2020 262. And the Department has informed the Committee that the statutory rule is led and comes in, uh, into operation and breach the 21-day rule. Um, Jim, how many of these statutory rules have we had so far have been in breach of the 21-day rule? I, I can check, Chair, but there have been quite a few recently, yes. I think uh, the Committee would be interested in, just so we're aware of that. The Department will be writing to the examiner of statutory rules separately to highlight this fact. Members, do we have any comments? As in light of what it was for and the coronavirus restrictions, there's not an awful lot we really could have done about that. But I do, I, I do, it does take the point that it sometimes can be misconstrued from the committee. Mm -hmm. If it goes out to that as if we haven't looked at other or all aspects of it, but basically if we we're in, you know, we are in agreement, sir. Uh, there are exceptional circumstances, and they have to be pushed, and we're trying to do as best we possibly can with the limited time that we have. But they, that it's worth noting uh, just what you did say there, and sometimes how, how that can be misconstrued or put back onto the committee. Okay. Thank you, Paul. 
Yeah, just on that, uh, let's be clear, we are working at pace here, so are the departments. And I am on record as saying that I would not be hard on the LPS uh, uh, organisation uh, when there's mistakes have been made over the last number of months. Uh, and, uh, you know, whilst we will question it and understand how it happened, that's a part of learning. But I'll not be tough on any organisation that has made mistakes and paid out money uh, in error and then trying to claw it back simply because of the amount of money that got down quickly mm -hmm. at that time. So, you know, in the spirit of this, the Minister has brought this forward in, in pace, in haste. Uh, and to be fair, we will have looked at this in haste. Mm -hmm. Now, if people want us to go through every line, dot every I, cross every T, we can do that, but it will take weeks. And businesses out there will not receive the money they, they need quicker. So there is a balance in all of this. Uh, so we take it in the spirit that it comes to us. We look and we scrutinise as best we can. It may be a case that we retrospectively look at things in order to learn lessons, but that's not being critical of the department or an organisation that was helped put the money out. That's mm. just so we learn lessons in the future. Mm. I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. And just, just on your uh, Deputy Chair's remarks, I think the interesting point is, having been in conversation with the Minister in numerous times, I have no doubt at all about the Minister's intent to get that money out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it just seems to me it's the remark from the press office of the Department of Finance who seem to be quite keen to do a bit of deflection. Yeah. I don't think that's in the spirit of it, because I would imagine for, not for one moment if the minister was in front of us right now, would he, be a, a, would he be in a position where he would say, we haven't done the job that's required of us. Mm -hmm. He hasn't done the job that's required of him getting the money out. And I think my remarks would probably address, address fairly clearly to the um, the press office of the Department of Finance, if we're content. Yep. Yep. So, uh, seek agreement for the members. If the members agree. Sorry. Uh, right. Sorry. Uh, I was just. You say uh, something? Yes, I was just going to say very briefly. I would. I would. I mean, I agree with a lot of what Paul Free just said. Um, I would just point out that it. It's worth just saying in terms of the Department of Finance press office. It's probably the line is just literally at the end of the of the piece. It's probably just that. Factually, the press officer just say, I, I, I don't, I would just say, I don't think that was a, uh, a grand scheme to deflect blame or um, hostility to the art committee. Genuinely, having been a press officer for many years, I think that was just a factual. <laughs> That's a declaration of interest. <laughs> there, but I, exactly. But I think it was just a, them factually saying that, um, you know, people have many <laughs> complaints about the outlet uh, or, you know, issues issues with for or against the, the outlet. But I. Just would say that I think the but anyway, it's not that important. <laughs> okay, thanks, Matthew. Yeah, that's the rest of it. And your declaration of interest is for fellow press officers is noted. Okay, let's seek agreement. If the members agree, the committee for finance has con uh, committee for finance has considered 2020-262 financial assistance coronavirus number two amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rules. So agreed. 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 Thank you. Moving on to item number seven, chairperson's business. Uh, Four members of correspondence from a member of the public regarding an ongoing dispute with the Department of Finance is at page 60, and the clerk's brief is included in the table papers at page three. Um, I have already made my declaration of interest on this point, so I will not say anything further, but if anybody wishes to do so, please direct the, direct the comments to me. Uh, I'm just slightly concerned, Mr. Chairman, that uh, as a committee we're going to this level. Um, because if we do, and we're going to be very busy for many months. Um, what I, we did when I was on the Justice Committee was we passed the correspondence on to the MLAs from the constituency and asked them to uh, pursue it uh, on the constituents' behalf. Um, the, the, unless it raises an issue, a much more wider issue of policy, rather than day-to-day -day procedure, uh, that, that would be my view. Um, thank you very much, indeed. and have, I know I've made a declaration of interest because he is this person is indeed a constituent of mine. There are, I believe, issues of policy involved with this, but that's what makes it difficult for me, sorry, within this committee, because I don't think I should be in the position to sort of influence the committee's uh, decision-making process in any way. So uh, 
either way. I think Philip was looking in on this. Sorry. Uh, I was just going to agree with uh, Jim Wells that, in general, if it's a constituent issue, I mean, we don't even need it on the agenda. I think it just should be forwarded on to constituent MLAs to deal with. No, that's the policy in the, the, the era committee. I'm on, we just agreed at the very beginning. I, I would say I agree um, with what's been said. Um, I think the pre we, we can't create a precedent that, um, uh, in, in, in the nicest possible way, this person, whomever he or she is, um, doesn't have standing other than they are a constituent. Um, if they were a, from an organisation or a business or something, I think there would probably be um, slightly more. But there, there are other channels for this to be discussed. Yeah, just uh, this is not the case, but it is already addressed it to the constituency MLA, mm -hmm. and uh, that uh, where does he go with it now? Then, in the event of him wishing to have it investigated, and given we say uh, the statements now that are in here, that would give us, I'm sure, just cause for concern. We said, look, we think, okay, what's happening there now? And rather than just close the door on the person because he has addressed it to the constituency MLA, who unfortunately. It's the chair of this committee then at the same time, so that uh, at least we should be able to, I think, maybe recommend this individual uh, a, a course of action that he can take to ensure that, we'll say, his concerns are heard. Jim? Uh, the only comment I was make uh, counter to the idea that we shouldn't be troubled with this is we don't have the facts in this matter, but we do have the concerning suggestion that Mr. Sterling refused to investigate a matter um, and he says there's legal advice touching upon that. Um, I feel somewhat in the dark about that but if there was a situation where someone is senior in the head of the, of the civil service refused to afford any investigation um, that would be something that would concern me as a member of this yeah. committee. Mm -hmm. I would have liked a little more information about that. Yeah, I think that uh, we do need to have more evidence gathered. There needs to be more. Um, the allegations would be extremely worrying, but I'm not too sure that it sits with this department or with this committee. So I think there's a couple of things here, and, and I know all committees grapple with this when there's individuals come to a committee uh, on an individual complaint. And yes, I think that it's right that you would explain to that person that there's avenues to go on uh, MLA representation, five of them if they wanted to, available of all five, uh, to push, pursue their interests and their complaint. Um, but I'm also always mindful of the whistleblower scenario where they could reveal a massive gaping hole in either policy or procedure in any given department. So I think we'll always have to look over any complaint that comes before us, and we may well have to decide on a one-by-one one issue. Uh, I think there is enough on a policy issue on this and on a procedural issue on this that suggests that the committee should look further into it, even in a general sense not necessarily a specific individual complaint. And I do think the individual complaint, that needs to be pursued by individual MLAs pushing or MPs pushing on their behalf, uh, re elected representatives pushing on their behalf. But I think there's enough here of a procedural and a policy issue that we can at least ask the department for further information on it to see where we go. And if we come back with more information and it's deemed then by this committee, no, that's it. So be it. Yeah, I think that's probably a reasonable compromise, actually. Uh, at that stage, we can decide if there is a policy issue. But be very careful here from my experience in justice. Once you go down this route, mm. every malcontent in Northern Ireland will be banging yeah. on your door. But would it be fair to ask the chair, and if it's not fair, you need an answer. But would it be fair to ask the chair, since he has more knowledge of us of this than any of us, does he think there's an issue of general importance attaching to 
say Mr. Sterling's approach to investigations or non-investigations? With, uh, without giving away particular details of the case, I would say very definitely there's policy issues in this and policy issues that go to the heart of the discussions that we've been having on everything from voluntary exit scheme to what's been going on in the NIO reports on civil service morale. On, and I think it also goes to the core of the uh, human uh, resource uh, set, uh, centre. And of course, NI, Northern Ireland Civil Service Human Resources come under our remit because it's part of the Department of Finance. So I think um, without, again, uh, speaking very carefully, there are significant policy issues that I have never been able to get to the bottom of. And I'm a fairly dil diligent MLA when it comes to chasing things down. And um, again, I'm being very careful about this, but I, I sense that there's a complete wilderness of mirrors out there, and I'm not quite sure why. But would a response from the department outweighing their view of this matter shed any light on it? Uh, maybe there'd be a better view coming to the, the committee than it ever came to me. Again, if I may, uh, like to the extent that you can talk about it in open session, to the extent that you are willing to talk about it, is this, are we to understand that this is a um, discrete, as in discrete ETE matter involving sort of human resources, one person's experience and a complaint or that from which he is inferring or um, kind of supposing a wider wider cultural problems or is it a is it were a list of complaints or insights uh, may i say that if i was looking at this pure, purely from a theoretical perspective and taking the individual out of it there are sufficient reasons to be concerned about how the overall process was being developed and some of the implications that lie in therein lie uh, and it's not just, I would strongly suspect, an issue with one individual. It may be much broader. Well, could I suggest further to what was said then, um, with, without prejudice to what we you know, do or don't investigate, that he, can, he is perfectly entitled to send um, evidence to a committee but um, it may not be that it is even this committee which is best placed to investigate it given it the public accounts committee has a particular role in some of these things I'm not deflecting yeah. responsibility because yeah. I'm on the public accounts committee <laughs> so if, if someone has to investigate <laughs> so um, that is no you know yeah. Lisa and I will have to be look Tim I've got to be honest I'm 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 very conflicted in this because obviously uh, it is a constituent of mine, but he's somebody who has sufficient concerns about the Northern Ireland Civil Service HR system and how he's been dealt with, but also there are issues that are of significant policy concerns that I've never been able to get to the bottom of. Um, no, I, I, no, I did not encourage him to write to the committee. I did not encourage him to do this, but he is perfectly entitled, as anybody else in Northern Ireland, to do that. He has, Which, however, yeah, he has, however, I see, been he's approached with the, the ombudsman and the audit office about this. Sure. Yeah, and, and basically, because yeah. of lack of access to data, um, uh, again, again, I have to be very careful about this. But uh, you know, we as a committee have had to deal with issues to do with things disappearing in the trim system. Uh, tracking out emails, and when you start sort of putting it all together, and uh, again, bearing in mind some of the other issues we have had to deal with as well, you can see that there is a that there's there at least is a, a concern that it might be worthy of. And again, I'm sort of very cautious about this. And if this goes on any further, I shall ask my very able deputy chair to s step in at this point. Sure. I'm just working out this in my head because you know my, my thought would have been either you refer him to the five uh, constituency MLAs or you refer him to the complaints process. The fact that he's been to the, the, ombudsman. the ombudsman and the auditor, uh, it's my view that if there's an issue that needs investigating, either or both of those groups will do it. If they decide that then there's a policy issue 
it then come, becomes an issue for the committee to deal with the aftermath of the investigation. I mean, I don't think the committee is an investigative no. body. They are. Uh, they will determine the rights and wrongs and merits, and then on the back of that, the committee would deal with whatever issue is raised. I mean, that's just my view of it. Mm. Um, Chair, on the back of just that, I think that there does have to be more evidence gathered on this issue. Though some of the allegations seem extremely worrying, but I don't think that that it, that it is the role, as I said at the first comment, for a committee. And I agree with Mr. Wells. Um, we need to be very cautious. Have you seen, if you're able to say, have you seen from the, either the audit office or the ombudsman their rationale for not pursuing this? Yeah. But it, it is. Um, oh, it's the easiest way to say. Uh, there is emphasis. emphasis insufficient evidence to proceed on some issues because the evidence hasn't been provided. It's not easily um, recovered. Uh, well, I suppose my, my instinct then is that, the ne personally, I suppose I worry about us as a committee having the bandwidth to begin a, um, uh, you know, a, an investigation into, into something that uh, that's, that's not to say that it's clearly on the face of it. He uh, has, he uses strong language to describe clearly what, from his perspective, a real concern. So I'm not being dismissive, but there is a, a bandwidth issue for us, sort of getting into a um, uh, chasing our tails on this, and, that, and that's not in any way to. Um, but I mean, if there's a way of him without prejudice submitting more information and us taking and him being aware that he isn't. The, the committee is not and cannot commit to any investigative process. Um, I would be content with that, but I think it has to be made clear to him that this is not the beginning of any form of investigation. It's merely. Uh, um, I'm, I'm now sort of, and I'm very, I'm sorry, I am conflicted. Uh, Mr. Deputy Chair, can I ask you to uh, chair the, this particular yeah. item on the agenda? Do it from situ here? Yeah, do it from situ, okay. please. Uh, yeah. yeah, so again, in the hands of the committee, I, I feel the tension and I agree with it. I just, I'm always, there's a counterbalance to this with regards to a whistleblower outcome and what could be revealed, uh, which could then be something of, of great weight and significance, which I think, looking back on the media and the public interest there, could be, well, look, did we neglect something at a point uh, that we should have looked into? So if we can. Whilst I agree the committee should not take individual grievance on board and run with that and investigate that, if there's a general aspect to this, if there's a, a more of a corporate issue around here on procedure and process, then I think we should ask at least questions of the department. How we frame those questions could be the tricky bit. Could I maybe suggest, and I'm maybe putting the onus and responsibility onto the staff, that maybe out of the information that we already have, and out of the information we may be able to glean from the from the person's elected representatives, could it be that there could be questions worded for us next week that then could maybe go to the department in a in a general sense around around us? Sorry, I'll take Jim and then. Sure. Uh, I share the concern about getting in too deep with an individual issue, um, but would it be useful to ask the department to give us their perspective on how this gentleman's complaint was handled? Because if we go to him and say, we want more information, we're encouraging him, yeah. as it were. Yeah. It may be that the department's response will provoke further questions. It may help us to put it to bed. It may do none of those things, but I thought there's anything to be lost by asking the department to give us their, their perspective on how this was handled and why there was no investigation, if that is the case. I, 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 I would be content with that if it, if it was done on a high-level brief yeah. We have, as a, as a matter of due diligence, we are following up with this person if we could have a brief summary. Um, but it might also be worth simultaneously asking that we get from the audit office their 
rationale because they will yeah. have taken the series and they were able to, and maybe even the ombudsman as well. I don't know exactly if he went to one or both of them at the same, if they went to them at the same time or one after the other, but the audit office would presumably be able to give us a steer as well. Has there been to the to the park? Have you seen this in the past? Sometimes individual cases such as this uh, come along. Uh, with this one, there's. I know members want to go and ask the department. Uh, I'm not sure that I have enough information to know what to ask the department. For it, yeah. But there is a line in there that says the issues I will raise go wider than DOF, possibly extending to the wider civil service. So would members be content possibly to go back to the individual and say, what are the policy issues in general terms associated with this? How did they manifest themselves? What was the impact of that? Those sorts of things, so that if there is a wider policy issue there, the committee could then look at it in that context. Yeah, I think that's, I'm going to bring uh, uh, Mr. McGorgan in a minute, but yeah, we'll have to respond to this person anyway. It would just be good nature for us to do that. Uh, and, and by asking those questions and ascertaining that information, then we will be in a better position to you know what we need to ask. Philip, you I mean, I have no, absolutely no difficulty with that, other than the fact that it sets a precedent. I mean, the, what we're doing as a committee is nothing that five constituency MLAs could not do as well and get the same information. I mean, that, that, that's just my view uh, on it. I mean, we're essentially taking on a constituency role. Are members content but to engage? But because he, because he does go into detail, or sorry, so he, because he does, there's enough in that letter for me to suggest that there's something procedural that there's a, at the core of the complaint. So because of that, or that he thinks that there's something procedural. Yeah. Mm. So so we, we have to respond to him anyway yeah. to, to either say yeah or nay. So I think if we seek further clarification the one time and see what comes out of it, and if nothing comes out of it then we will just say, look, the committee has made a decision and we would recommend that you, you, you know, pursue this through your elected representation. And if there is something of policy in nature, then we can go to the department and find out just what their take of it is. And that's then bringing in Jim's point with regards to then engaging with the oh. department. Okay. Are members content? But then, through the chair, if that comes back, is that confidential? Well, they could make it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, we could we could do it and we could we could talk about it and discuss any yeah. response we get and close matters. There's no problem there. Close session, sorry. Are members content with that approach? Again, I, I do get the nervousness around this because I do not want to open the finance committee or any other committee for that matter into a precedence whereby they're they're having to rec uh, uh, respond to every single issue out there because there's some there's multiple mass issues out there with regards to people. Uh, would, would members want to, to uh, in relation to considering it in, in confidentially in closed session, uh, do members want to caveat that with should the individual wish the committee yeah. to do so? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and that might encourage the, the member of the public then to come forward with more information than he would otherwise. And maybe then, if it flies through the chair, we can then point him as well in the right direction and bring it back to the MLAs. Absolutely true, yeah. The members content then to move on in that way? We're not committed to taking it on. We're just mm. yes, uh, and I think that should be made clear too yes. with regards to what the procedures are here. Are members content to move on? If so, I'm going to hand yes. back to the chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for Deputy Chair for stepping in there. Uh, just before I move on to the next item, a chairperson's of business. Just so you're aware, uh, the Chancellor's uh, Barnet the uh, indication of Barnet consequentials likely to come to Northern Ireland from the Chancellor's statement is 790 million. But we don't know whether that's in year or whether that's over the that, that should be I think that should be over the year. But that's an additional seven hundred and ninety million, seven nine zero. Okay. Let's move on to the next item. Be, that's that's twenty twenty two, twenty three. Yeah. Twenty two, twenty three. Twenty no, no, 21, 21, 21, 22. 22. Sorry, I'm jumping 21, a year ahead, everyone. Yes. <laughs> yeah. it's, the, it's the next financial year, the one yeah, that we're yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But again, sir, we should, uh, again, I would imagine that the Department of Finance will be getting their briefing. We got him as soon as he sat down. 
Yeah, you should have had the briefing. So yeah, they send emails out as soon as he sits down. So for next week, I would expect us to have seen some kind of or something from the, the minister or from the, the Department of Finance on a detailed breakdown, because I imagine it'll be split between, uh, I'm not quite sure it's all coming into the central pot, so we just need to keep a careful eye on that. But again, I sort of... Uh, well, if it's a Barnet consequential, that's a good means of question. If it's a Barnet consequential, it, that means it goes it into the, the Northern Ireland Consolidated Fund to be spent by yeah. the executive. Um, there will be other, obviously, UK-wide spending that is um, uh, not Barnet. Were there any significant capital commitments? No, I haven't. I haven't seen a breakdown. It's just flashed up. This, but I, I thought it would be appropriate for the finance committee at least. <laughs> at least we knew that we were looking at, you know, another seven hundred. Uh, sounds sounds strange, but another seven hundred and ninety million. But how that how that looks as well, mm. and that's particularly important. When we're looking at the profiling, and indeed with the minister who's looking to carry over funding. I think that's quite important that we understand what the whole sort of picture is is likely to be with the additional sort of spending. Uh, next, the, the Director of the Royal Society of Ulster Architects corresponds to the Finance Minister seeking clarification and building regulations relating to energy performances buildings on page 62. Members, do we have any comments? Could I have your agreement to ask the Department to provide a written briefing to the Committee outlining the provisions in the nearly zero energy buildings requirement? and to respond to the question raised by the Royal Society of Ulster Architects for consideration by the Committee on the 9th of December and in to, to uh, inform RUSA of the Committee's approach. Are we content? Thank yes. you. If it's Fuel Poverty Day, I think, on Friday. It's a good moment to ask for an update from the Department. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I'm sure, just as we mentioned, the, the Barnard coincidences are coming through. Uh, Northern Ireland, the fact that the South is surging ahead with well established nearly zero energy regulations and technical guidance, coupled with over 221 million funding announced for residential and community retrofit schemes. Um, as we, that's the way we need to be thinking. And uh, I don't know, is, is there any more that we can do, or is there anything else? I'm just looking at that 7.2 to the from the letter from the Royal Society, is there any way that we can like, try to show some support or, or, or try to influence policy from the, from the Finance Committee in order to get that money spent and get it out there? These are going to be quick wins, looking at the new green energy deal and where we're trying to go. It's only a point from myself for making out loud. But is there anything that we can do or anything that can push that on from this finance committee? Or should we be looking at a joint approach between ourselves, economy yeah, and yes. infrastructure? Yes. Matthew? I just think Pat makes a good point, but it's probably given if we're going to get a, an update based on Kieran Fox's um, letter, we can get an update from on, on the, what the department is doing and use that as a, um, as a starting point in terms of engaging with their policy program. Okay. Uh, moving on to agenda number 98, a correspondence response from the department regarding localised restrictions to sports scheme, page 69. Any comments? Happy um, to note. Well, just, just to note, Mr Chairman, that I think our inboxes are all full of people who still haven't received their payments. Yeah. Um, and again, the poor departments can't win here because we criticise them for rushing the money out the door and not checking it properly. And then we criticise them for being a bit more careful and checking uh, that payments are to the proper businesses. Uh, but I have to say, this, it has seemed to have ground a halt in some areas. The Minister of Finance at question time yesterday said that roughly about half of the payments were out, and that prompted Mr Frew uh, to make the point that that means there's a large amount of money that's still not been paid. Now, I'm starting to get businesses telling me that, um, well, first of all, they were delighted with the speed with which the money went out in April and May. That was very good. Now, they've built into their assumptions that the money would come out almost as quickly this time, and it hasn't happened. And it's the single biggest issue that I'm facing at the moment. Now, I'm telling them why we have to be careful and that this due diligence and the money will arrive. 
Some of them are hitting cash flow problems because they didn't anticipate, particularly on the non-essential retail, they didn't anticipate what was going to happen. That was nobody's cards this time last week. Nobody thought this was coming. And then, but we're not even talking about that. We're talking about the people who've been closed down earlier who still haven't had a penny. And I know we've been lobbying on this, but it's starting to become a real pain. And I'm only saying that so I can report back to constituents that I spoke to one of the most powerful bodies in Northern Ireland, the Finance Committee of the Northern Ireland Assembly, and I raised this point with the Chairman and, and, and Mr McManus here, the top man, just to make it, people aware that there's a lot of pain out there. Yeah, and, and thank you. You raise, you raise a good point, Jim. Um, and again, I think, uh, and I was struck by the finance minister's comments, and also from the evidence we've received from LPS as well. I mean, we have no doubt that they're doing their best to get the money out. But again, there does seem to have been a a delay that seems to be um, quite. It's, 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 difficult, it's difficult to say because I've had reports from both sort of companies that say that they had had the money and other companies that said that, that they haven't, but they've been told it's on its way. And in some respects, they're reticent to come back to me because having been told it's on its way, they're, they're, they expect it to arrive. One of the things I was going to suggest with your approval is can we get an update, it's just a written update from the department um, for next our next meeting, just on an outline of how much is still outstanding to be paid on a rough schedule of timelines and when it's likely to happen. Pat? And just a little more on that. I mean, we also then should ask, does LPS need more resources? We've already thanked the LPS in here we, uh, for their quick responses and, like Jim, you know, with the, the level of constituents that are coming back. Maybe they, to ask the finance or to ask LPS, do we find that they, there's more resources needed in LPS in order to get that money out? Yeah, I don't blame LPS for this at all, um, and I'll tell you why. They have a system that's designed to bring money in, not out. And 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 here's here's the thing: cogs turn slow in government. We all know this. We're okay in this room. We sit in this big grand room. I know of a single mum, a hairdresser, three children, and if it wasn't for an aunt, those children would be starving. Mm -hmm. I know a couple of employers who their families are concerned with regards to their welfare, with regards to mental health. I don't know that we know the actual torment that's going on out there. And we're looking at a mechanical machine that's churning out money. My question is this. When we've always talked about a second lockdown, or sorry, a second wave, and that with that second wave, there may be a chance that it could be lockdowns or lockdown. And we have been told by the Chief Medical Officer that there may be a number of these lockdowns over the winter. Why was there, or was there work done over the summer to identify strands of business who well could then be branched off as locked down, as they were, and itemised out? And surely... Surely what's happened here is that that work is being done in real time as they've been trying to get the money out also. So my question is, was there no preparatory work done at all? And second of all, the, the, the information flow that they're getting now with regards to the money, are they retaining that for the chance that in January, February or March, if we're locking down again, that, that would be a much more quicker and sharper, speedier system? So that's the question. What, uh, what work was done before the lockdowns, whenever we knew that there could be a second wave? And second of all, what, what information and data has been retained so that if it happens again in the future, that, would be able, that money would be able to get down quicker? Two questions, and just one before I bring Philip in. I think it was when we were LPS last week, we were struck, or I was particularly struck, by the, the lack of flow of information from the Department of Economy to LPS and back. Yeah. And we asked them to show us a copy of the MOU, because I think the MOU we thought would detail who was supposed to be expecting and when they were supposed to be expecting and the rest of it. And I think I got the sense from LPS that they were expecting something to come, but they just didn't feel as if they had enough information that came from it. 
So, and indeed, I think it's very important that we get an overview of how the money is going out and what left is left to come out. But I think it might also be appropriate if we get an understanding from the Department of Economy what they're doing about sort of getting money out as well. Philip? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think we should certainly ask for oh, an update uh, just on the, the current scheme. Uh, I mean, I, I'm as frustrated as everybody else because I mean, we understand the, the, the problems that the LPS have and, and all the other departments. If you're a hairdresser with a family, you don't really understand far less do you care, you just want your money. So I completely understand. I, mean, I, I agree with you, Chair, in that uh, sometimes I think the Department for the Economy gets off far too late in, in these discussions we have here and, and in the Chamber. Uh, I mean, I was struck by the press release that you were, you were uh, reading earlier uh, about some of the things that the Department for the Economy officials were saying. So, I mean, I think the LPS are doing a good job in difficult circumstances. Probably a job they shouldn't be doing. It's probably a job that should be done by the Department for the Economy. But uh, I mean, I certainly think this committee, who uh, work with the LPS, should be right in looking for an update on this grant scheme. I, I actually would broadly agree with that. I think there's a the way. Sympathise with some of the broader points Paul's making. The, the blunt truth is, I would say that uh, the broader question about lead responsibility for economic uh, planning and economic planning as relates to um, the um, potential second wave and the coronavirus generally is clearly the responsibility of the Department of Economy. I'm more than happy to be. And I, I definitely think we should get an update from the Department of Finance. I'm not sure I, I agree with that, and, and there are tough questions to be asked about the getting money at the door. LPS have done a good job, and I'm not um, saying they haven't. There are specific, I think, and reasonable questions to ask. would also say, though, the broader question about um, uh, what, you know, economic, what policy making was done using lessons from uh, on, on, the, on, 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 on the economy, for using lessons from we have won, probably won for. Um, the economy department, but also um, there, there is a, one question that could be asked, I think usefully of the Department of Finance is uh, what data was you know, di what data was gathered from tranche one in terms yep. of how well it worked, and did the Department of Economy ask for that were there any um, was there any activity between the two of them in terms of planning but I think you know in terms of policy economic policy making it's the Department of Economy who are more in the lead on that I think. Just in terms of managing our own time as much as anything else. Okay, thanks, Pat. Well, oh, sorry, oh. Jim. First of all, I think we all should stay up to three in the morning from now on because we seem a lot sharper today than we probably <laughs> are. So obviously, our brains are working very well, and there's some excellent points being made. And I think Paul and Matthew's points are both excellent because it, well, undoubtedly there will be further tranches of payments made. So they had a should have a category: all the eligible hairdressers. All the eligible hotels, all the eligible B&Bs, uh, cleanse that data, have it ready, so that the next time, if there's payments being made, they just simply have to push a button. Are they going to go back and reinvent the wheel and start to look at all of the uh, categories again? The other thing is, you notice in the press comment, com uh, commentary on the wind turbine issue, all is not well, but in the relationship between DFP and Department of Economy, it's quite clear that when we've had a chance to look behind the scenes. There seems to be problems in reaching agreement. And it was interesting that Mr Snowden at the hearing last week complained about how long it took <coughs> to get responses back from the Department of Economy, and I've no doubt the same is the other way round. And we're in a slightly difficult position here because DFP is only one part of the story here. Mm -hmm. Invest Northern Ireland has a very important role in providing funding for businesses. They're not doing well. And yes, I agree entirely. I think they are less attuned to giving money out than land and property services. I know where there's protocols to be followed here, but I think we have a right to also to contact Invest Northern Ireland, having informed the relevant committee, and to find out what's going on at mm. their end, yeah. as well as our own, without tramping on the toes. Who is the chair of the Department of the Economy Committee? Virtual. Virtual. Yeah. Uh, to, to write to her and say, look, you understand why we have to do this, because I would be concerned that if businesses don't get this funding, that if they're not able to build up a surplus over Christmas to last them through the lean years of January, lean months of January and February, we're going to see mass closures, and therefore they must get this money in the run-up to Christmas. 
And I'll be honest with you, if they make a few mistakes by rushing it out, yep. I think we need to say, we're not going to hold you to that. We're not. Because we can't have our cake and eat it. We can't ask for it to be dashed out and then complain when a small amount, less than 2%, went to the wrong people. That's totally unfair. Yep. But if we do it properly and do a cost-benefit analysis and an assessment of every applicant, they'll get it by next September. And what goods that to them? Yeah. That's the difficulty we're in. And thanks, Jim. And it also raises another point as well, because we have heard much of the uh, £95 million voucher scheme, and I don't think any of us have any oversight how that's going to be done. And one of the issues we had when we had when we were talking with LPS, of course, was the issues when it was trying to find out matching it against rate pairs, rate pairs IDs, home addresses, and the rest of it. So I think there is indeed some legitimate questions to be asked about how this money is going to come out, how it's going to flow, how it's going to be managed, and how we look at the overall sort of uh, sort of how, the, how this interrelationship between finance and uh, economy work. Major, but just to be, just to be just to test that. Sorry, is Matthew. It? Sorry, Lisa, you come in. Sorry, Lisa. Uh, just, and, uh, I agree entirely just with the comments that, that have been made both in relation to the Department of the Economy and Invest NI, and you're quite right. In fact, that was the point that I want to just emphasise as well, too, that uh, in terms of LPS and their database, uh, to ensure, because there's clearly gremlins there, you know, in many respects. I think that was admitted uh, at last week's meeting as well, too. And uh, just as it has been eloquently described how some people are on the red line, and I've been dealing with a few cases just exactly like that, that were, in fact, that whenever eventually it got to the stage as a result of misinformation that the LPS held, that uh, the recipients knew that they were getting the money for it to be paid into the wrong bank account. Yeah. So uh, it's that type of situation that could you have developing as well. Too. And I think that all that uh, needs to be uh, uh, scrutinised and uh, in a way whereby that, that database is totally up to date and that in the event of uh, recurrent situations down the line, which we all expect, that is there uh, ready to respond to the needs of um, our um, people involved in business. Yeah, thanks, Mr. And of course, now that we've had two iterations of it, I mean, the learning process of getting the most up-to-date and accurate database should be quite a long way down to being able to make sure we've got an accurate uh, sort of output as possible that both economy and uh, finance can work from. Matthew, sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, my point was really, I suppose, just that is us uh, honing down on what our action is and what our responsibility is in terms of the, the in terms of the ninety-five million uh, voucher scheme. It will be uh, important for us all as MLAs to interrogate how it works. It's a, a novel and uh, interesting policy idea, which will be. Uh, very interesting to see how it's implemented. There's lots of economists who think that kind of thing is a good way of stimulating demand. There are other legitimate criticisms of it, so it'll be interesting to see how it But My only point is that it's for us, the Department of Committee of Finance. Noted. It is a, a fundamentally, you know, we have to be, there's so much going on, we have to be careful about prioritising. So we are the Committee for Finance, and so it's just about, it's a little bit like what we talked about in the last item with the potential whistleblower, about using our time well and focusing our energy. Yeah. Thank you very much, Steve. We need to get the payments out as well, Matthew. Sorry, Chair. Otherwise, there will be a whole lot of worry about finance. OK, if we move on to the next item um, of correspondence. The Committee for Communica Communities regarding the licensing and registration of clubs amendment call for evidence, page 71. Members, do we have any comments? Are we content to note? Noted. Uh, Department uh, regarding Dormant Accounts Fund, page 72. Members, do we have any comments on the Dormant Accounts Fund? To be honest, Mr Chairman, um, I was slightly tied up last night and didn't get a chance to have a look at this. Could I ex ask for the committee's indulgence that we could carry this forward to the next meeting? Yeah, I, I think I would agree because to that. I raised this issue and, to be honest, I, I didn't you need to have a look at it. time to look at it last night. There's something on. I can't okay. remember what it was. We're content. We'll move that on to the next week. Can I just go back briefly, if I may, Chair? Sorry, I'm just bringing up the correspondence because I seem to have lost it there. Um, and this is to, uh, around um, uh, the uh, call for evidence on uh, licensing. Um, there is in the uh, one um, there is a potential interaction here, which I think it might be worth us having a, uh, leaving it to next week and having a brief item. It doesn't need to be a full agenda item, but maybe 
doing what we're doing with um, dormant accounts and pushing it back a, 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 a further week. I think the licensing bill is really important. It's going to be particularly critical uh, in relation to the uh, licensed trade and how uh, they uh, <coughs> cover as a whole uh, in the first half of next year, but also how uh, you know we, we think about the, these amenities, which are uh, community pubs going forward. So in a sense, that legislation could be a really important opportunity for us to, to, um, to do useful things in the, in the wake of this enormous economic shock. So I wonder if one, one potential thing we might be minded to do is to uh, <coughs> investigate the uh, rates uh, data around um, uh, and ask LPS for information around uh, Around, around that, um, I would be happy to make a formal proposal. Would you like to ship a formal proposal, and <coughs> I think we'd give that a fair wind? Yeah, I'm not ready to do it now, but yeah, if I you think could, there might be, uh, there might be a, maybe a maybe outside, outside the committee, but send it to us, and we'll yeah, agree to. Fine. If we're content, I think we are. Okay. And dormant accounts next week, Jim. Okay. Uh, correspondence from the department regarding the NIC ICTU response to public service pension schemes, twenty <coughs> seven. Um, we're scheduled, uh, I would like to seek agreement to schedule oral, oral evidence with the uh, NIC ICTU once the committee receives the outcomes from the consultation. I think it would be important to do that, particularly with the public service pensions. Yeah. Are we content? Yep. Yes, Mr Chairman. <coughs> just, uh, some of us have been lobbied quite extensively by uh, police officers yep. on yep. this scheme. Mm. And I'm wondering, for instance, uh, does the Police Federation um, have our approach on this, or is there a body that could give us evidence? Because it, it's particularly germane to police. And I think I've had about seven officers or ex officers on to me about it. Um, is there any way we could perhaps see if there's a body that could give us evidence from, from their perspective? Jim? I must say, police officers who've been with me feel that the Police Federation is compromised on this, yes. and that they consented to the process. Under no, I think it's specifically about pensions. Uh, yes. This would normally be a justice issue, but this is specific to is. the, the, the police pensions are possibly separate. They might be covered under justice. If, if members are content for me to check that, e, I think that's <coughs> the same principles are being applied to police pensions as, uh, on the required as everybody else. That's yeah. the 2015 and no further. And there's very important, unique points have been raised by police officers to me as to why that's particularly inequitable. Now, I think. Though it's justice, I think because it's McLeod, we can look at it. Okay. Uh, if with with your with the committee's indulgence, I would like uh, Jim to do a bit of an sorry. Uh, I think it's an issue for the police. Clark, Jim, to investigate that, and then report back. Okay. Uh, moving on from the committee from the executive office regarding North South Ministerial Council special EU programmes. Members, do we have any comments? Uh, can I seek your agreement to write to the Minister of Finance in support of the proposal from the Committee for the Executive Office that he meets with the 11 local councils and to ask the Minister to meet with the three cross-border partnership bodies with a view to easing concerns that they have around future EU funding, particularly if he gets an oversight of when it's coming? Yes. Yeah. And can we also copy the letter to the Committee for the Executive Office and the three cross-border partnership bodies as well? For happy? Thank you. I seek your agreement to note the remaining items of correspondence. Okay. Uh, seek your agreement to note the information request to the department, and uh, seek agreement to note the routine paper circulated on Friday, the 20th of November, 2020. Okay. Okay. If we move on to the forward work programme, four members an updated forward work programme for September, December, so page 96, and four members of the D director, director business leader. Is that right? Director Business Leader UK Fire and Glasgow Office Leader Arup is available on the 2nd of December to provide oral evidence to the Committee on the Amendment of the Building Regulations. Are you content? And if we are content to receive oral evidence on the 2nd of December regarding the Amendment to the Building Regulations Northern Ireland 2012. Content? And seek, schedule, uh, seek agreement to schedule the oral evidence sessions next week. Uh, inform members that the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors has agreed to give oral evidence on either the 9th or the 16th of December on outstanding dilapidation payments. Uh, if we are if you're agreed, can we receive the oral evidence? I suggest probably on the 16th. Would that probably be? Chair, I've uh, I've asked them to hold off on, a, on an exact date because it, if the budget comes on one date, then we can slot them in on the other. Yeah, date exactly. And vice okay. versa. Okay. 
Are we are we content? Uh, following, I inform members the following organisations have agreed to give oral evidence regarding public sector reform and to support the committee to understand and identify inno innovative drivers for and barriers to change and improvements. OECD on the 27th of January, NIPSA on the 3rd of February, and Pivotal <laughs> on the Pivotal, not Pivotal, on the uh, on the uh, 10th of February. Are we content? <laughs> And we're keen to receive oral evidence from them and the dates identified. Can I just uh, ask a quick question, Chair? Just on the um, my favourite uh, um, issue, my former employers, just about whether it's worth asking, particularly given the day the Senate. It says uh, items to be scheduled, HM Treasury, uh, written response. We are, they're, we're still outstanding. They're responding to our request for oral evidence. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a response yet. Okay, fine. So that's, okay. but, but, but that is an item to be scheduled as hopefully an oral evidence session with them. Yeah. Should they agree? Should, Should they, they agree? agree to it? Yeah. Well, well, we might be able to can help convince them somehow. <laughs> uh, so, are we content for the draft forward work program September December September December 2020? Great. Uh, any other business? I have an item of any other business that I'm going to raise in closed session just after this. Um, anybody else? Any other areas of business? Okay, the date and time of the next meeting, Wednesday the 2nd of December at 1400 in the Senate Chamber. Let me just move quickly into closed session. Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber.